and welcome, ladies and gentlemen, to the monastery, the open bar of the internet, the world's greatest shit show, and the place where we, the good brothers and sisters of this most holy of temples, seek enlightenment through the drunkest, craziest, and most batshit ways possible. I am your one and only gaming monk, better known as Mildra, and with me I have a returning good brother to the temple. Coming to coming to us straight from Hoodwink Games, formerly the madman behind the Blade RPG and, and Basic and Generic, now coming to us with Starset, the Great Dimming, the one and only Josiah Mork. How are you doing today, man? I'm doing real well. All the better to be here. How are you doing? I'm doing good. Congratulations on getting three times over, over your initial um, goal at the time of this recording. Oh, thank you. Yeah, it's been fun to see the turnout. We've got some, a lot of new faces. Uh, this is a, a new hype for us. We're excited to see what we can do with it. Mm -hmm. So, I know that you, I recall in the past you had, you had mentioned having a background with, um, for, with 40k, but what, si what systems would you say, what systems or games would you say were, would be the Appendix N in terms of inspirations for Star Set? Yeah, so Wrath and Glory, the 40k system, was definitely a big um, uh, idea just because, I mean, 40k forged the grimdark genre, so you gotta look there at least a little bit. Um, but also they had a really interesting dice pool system that we were kind of, I, I looked at and read through. Don't love everything that they do with it, and you'll see that kind of in the game, some of those discrepancies if you're a faithful um, Imperium player. But uh, we also pulled a little bit from Traveler, just some ideas of their character creation. Um, you might recognize from first edition Traveler, mm -hmm. the concept of dying during character creation um, and some of those kind of phase of life ideas. Again, we executed it very differently in more of a choose your own adventure type narrative of character building rather than the cyclical phases that Traveler uses. But those two were undeniably huge influences as we're kind of forging together this new set of rules. Yeah, I can I can certainly get I can certainly get that. Uh and it is funny that you bring up Traveler because that because um that was my one thousand sub challenge where I said if I get a thousand subs I will review um Traveler. Cause oh, really? the thing I was sweating about 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 the idea of reviewing Traveler is how the hell do I summarize Traveler's history of a di of system jumping into a few minutes? Oh man, I don't admire that task. <laughs> How'd it go? It went all right. I kind I kind of screwed up because I because one of the because one of the one of the games that I put in my history list technically wasn't a part of Traveler, even if it was even if it was from the same from the same ballpark. But mm. but um no but the person who pointed it out did did admit that they can they didn't hold it against me that I made that mistake because. When you when you've jumped in when you've jumped between four di four different systems across multiple companies, this kind of thing is going to happen. Oh yeah, in like what forty years of history or something now at this mm -hmm. point. Although, if I had, if I had a nickel for every time a game that came out of GDW did system jumping, I'd have two nickels, which isn't a lot, but it's <laughs> weird that that happened twice. The other, <laughs> the other one being Space eighteen eighty nine, which is also making a comeback. Oh, nice! I haven't but, heard that one, but I'm writing it down now as you say that. But I, um, I was go, I had, I was going to be review, the I had eventually, I had eventually reviewed the second edition Mongoose version of Traveler. Mm -hmm. Um, mostly because democracy, because it was either going to be that or Traveler Five, and <laughs> I put, I put up a, I put up a poll on on Twitter, and Mongoose second won. I was wor I was worried that right. some people were gonna pick Traveler Five just to fuck with me. <laughs> oh. What's the? I actually don't think I, I. For the purposes of this, we were reading Traveler Four, so I'm not familiar with Five. What's the big uh, the big twist there? Five is a glorified retro clone for a lot of the early days and um, charts. Nothing. Ah. <laughs> charts and charts and <laughs> charts. And I already paid my debt with Chart Hell. Oh, no. I, I don't feel. One of these days, I'm going to I'm going to have to make a um I'm going to have to make a video that it that is um, much like how Dante had his 
had his um, seven layers of hell. I need to go through the seven the seven layers of RPG RPG spreadsheets. Oh no! <laughs> uh, to see if to see if I can go through the seven deadly sins of, of each. And I'd just... be curious to hear because I have to say we do use charts. I'm oh, a graphic I'm, I'm... designer, <laughs> so I don't just dump them. I'm but not, there are a I'm, lot of charts in Star Citizen. There, there kind of has to be, especially if you're using that life path system, which mm -hmm. I'm no stranger to doing life path streams on on this channel, so I may use that. I may use that down the road. But oh, I'd love it. And if I do that, I'll prob I'll probably put a death count thing thing on the on the side for how many for how many times that happens. <laughs> Hopefully not too often. We don't want to cause too much frustration, but um, it's knock a on wood mechanic. right now. Oh yeah. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> I have learned. I have learned not to te not to tempt the gods of irony. Mm. But, the cruel one. As I as I understand it, the ba the um the basic setup for the for the for the way that the di for the way that your die system works is it's a d6 pool. Um, mm -hmm. three or three, um, four, fours and f fours and fives are one hit. Sixes are two hits and ca and can explode. Yep. And one and ones cause you to lose a hit. Yep. I I know you refer to it as checks. I use with these kind of systems. I call it I call it hits just out of habit. You can blame Shadowrun, which I hope you guys don't have the same the same amount of dice that Shadowrun does. Nope. Nope, that's not the plan. <laughs> I just did a cursory perusal of Shadowrun, and when I couldn't make sense of it in the first ten minutes or so, I said, "All right, this is interesting, but we're going to do something different." Like I can, I've I've been able to help people make sense of it, but um, I have I have gotten myself in in hot water for saying that it needs to it needs to dial it back with its skill system mm -hmm. and action and actually make um. As blasphemous as this may sound, Shadowrun needs a class system because people oh, are yeah. people are. Yeah, it claims to be freeform, but if you, but um, you're gonna have somebody who's the face man. You're gonna have somebody who's the street Sam. You're gonna have somebody who's the who's the mage. Always geek the mage first. So you may you you may you may you may, you may as well go you may as well go all in. That's if I was if I was. Rewriting Shadowrun, that's what I would do is build is build that, and that's what some people have done who've done hacks of it for PBTA. But fair enough. I mean, I think if you're gonna if you're gonna do something freeform, you need to have a reason to not do classes. Or you need to have something that kind of keeps people from just defaulting to that structure. Because mm -hmm. I mean, otherwise that's just how people know to play. Yeah. Um, and that's kind of the fun thing about our character creation is that you know you get to influence a little bit of how you need, mm -hmm. but your character honestly is mostly developed by your decisions about your how you live rather than how you play, and then how you live influences how you play. Yeah. Now, I will admit one. I will admit one. One that I um, one one particular source material that did pop up in the back of my mind as I was studying through Star Set was. Um, fading suns. If, if in setting more than in mechanics. Hmm. Well, it has a similar name, but I can't say I've looked at fading suns yet. Um, for the longest time, it was the closest we'd get to a Dune RPG because Chronicles of the Imperium was way too expensive. Okay. But. Hmm. Let's see, I'll look it up as we go. Yeah. And uh, I will I will say that the way the way that the setting is described of the of these of the of these ma these massive cities these massive oppressive cities does in a in a in a weird way kind of remind me of um, hive cities. Mm. It's I the, can see that. the big example, of course, is Necromunda, which. Calling Necromunda a hellhole is an insult to hellholes. <laughs> it's true. We do branch a little bit. Um, the idea of like the Hive City, I mean, like you said, classic example, Warhammer 40k, Necromunda, you know, that is the living hell of the Grimdark world. Mm -hmm. um, 
but we have a lot of fun kind of looking more into what it would like actually look like to expand across the solar system because in all reality at least in man's early expansion there just isn't going to be the resources to sustain a huge quantity of people at a huge centralized location like that and so you're going to have places like earth where you have mega cities still and you definitely have the mega bureaucracy the supreme republic of man that's going to be kind of you know get its fingers in everything but once you leave earth into some extent mars you kind of just have little pockets and like little asteroid settlements and little bunches of survivors um because we're really trying to look at, you know, what does the supply chain look like to survive? What does the transportation and growing look like to survive? And kind of getting more into the nitty gritty part. And honestly, the nitty gritty can be as terrifying as the fictional. <laughs> and so that's something that I'm hoping to kind of bring out in like the science of the setting. Mm -hmm. And I do, I do appreciate that you. When you said that um, on the Kickstarter that spaceships are not sexy, they're fragile, tedious hulks of steel and code. Mm -hmm. Once again, to bring up 40k, the first thing that comes to mind is space hulks. <laughs> yep. Which, Classic. If I can't if I can't use space hulk, I'd I'd say. Oddly enough, oddly enough, I'd I'd use the ship in the film Virus. Which. Oh, I haven't. For I'd say I'd say if, I'd say if you want I say if you want a bit a bit of inspiration for a for an SF creature feature that's especially when you deal with a lot of machine that's gonna that's gonna be it. Hmm. All right, I'm pulling up picture here now. Oh. Yeah. Okay. I could see it. Mm -hmm. That's still kind of on the the, the chalk side. Kind of like what we're looking at is more the uh, the oh. ISS, I guess, where you've got kind of all the little fragile veins, and by Hulk, you know, they're huge and they weigh like a gobzillion pounds if they were on Earth. Yeah. But here, you know, everything's fragile. Everything has to be meticulously taken care of. And as players, most of the time, you'll never even get to control the spaceship unless you're really skilled and a really advanced character. Uh, because if you think about the training that has to go into operating something like that, is just overwhelming um and if you screw up you know it can affect the whole solar system if you run into like a, a particularly important space station or settlement or something like that mm -hmm. and all of those implications are kind of laid out so players can take it or leave it but um if you kind of enter the game with the mentality of like the warhammer 40k space hulk uh you're gonna have a pretty rude awakening pretty quick yeah now What's what I find interesting is the um, die pool approach that you have, especially in relation to its action economy, because it mentions mm -hmm. you can roll up to five die per action, and you have as many actions until your die pool is empty. Mm -hmm. um, e even with now, even with that, is it going to be a case where your di where your die pool early on is fi is fairly li is fairly limited, or? Is it, or is it a case of how far, how 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 willing are you going to be to gamble on an action? It's going to be fairly limited. The right now, this. Oh, you're going to start with eight dice, mm -hmm. uh, and so that's going to be enough, you know, for one full roll and then three extra dice that you could try on a second action, or you know, you can split it up to do. Um, you know, four actions with two dice or so on. Yeah. So the odds aren't great, but it gives you enough that you can, on your turn, you can be relatively confident that you can succeed at one thing you're okay at. And then it gives you the odds to maybe do another thing. Um, so it's not like, you know, D&D &D or, or something where you're going to be like, I'm pretty sure I can do this. I'll roll, get your plus and so on. There's going to be a lot more of a risk right off the bat, but it's not so much that you're kind of, paralyzed to start the game like you can still do stuff you can still have fun with it it's as much risk as you want to take yeah and based on what i'm seeing your die pool also doubles as your health since if you get since if you get it if you get hurt you're you're um, gonna be rolling less die yep that's right so if you get hurt uh, after your turn then you'll start your next turn with fewer dice relative to the damage that you took mm -hmm. so it kind of 
fix you in this situation where as you start working towards harder goals or fighting bigger bosses, then your action economy starts to dwindle and you have to decide as a character, are you the type of person who's going to grind through to the end and try and achieve, you know, notoriety of some kind, or are you going to kind of slink away and retreat and go back to be part of the hordes of the grim dark world of just somebody who's surviving. Mm Mm-hmm. Now, how do skills play a factor into this? Since you've got quite a, you've got quite a few skills, and a lot of them are in are in a interesting um, linkage. Yes. Yeah, so we have two types of skills. So you have uh, your typical skill, which you're going to have a value of, um, and it's going to be called your required role. So that we abbreviate to RR, um, and it, we're still hammering out the starting for those, but. Um, There'll be things like, you know, first aid where it's pretty difficult, but it's passively you can get by to things like chemistry and engineering, where unless your character is particularly trained at it, you have no, pretty much no chance of success Um, to things like power, where you're always going to have at least some chance of success because pretty much anybody can throw a punch. Um, And then you also have linked skills. And these skills are essentially just skills that affect the difficulty of others. So how this works is you as a character know what you need to roll in order to achieve, say, an engineering roll. Like it's right there on your sheet. Maybe it's a five, maybe it's a six. And then the GM will tell you, or in this case, the overlord, call them the overlord and such that. The overlord will tell you that this is a, a easy, average, difficult, or impossible check. And that will multiply your required role. So if it's easy, you just have to roll what's on the sheet. Mm-hmm. If it's difficult, you have to roll one and a half times what's on the sheet. And if it's impossible, you have to roll double what's on the sheet. Um, and so how this works is if you are you know, trying to do a task that you should be really good at, but you are in an impossible situation, you can roll a linked skill to lower the difficulty of the skill that you're rolling right now back down to average. Mm-hmm. So a good example of this, um, to have the sheet right with me, so I should pull it up here. But I'm trying to think like, um, I think flexibility, for example, is like linked to concealment. So if you're trying to conceal yourself in a really awkward place, it might be almost impossible. But then you can make a flexibility roll that's always going to be average. All of the link skills are average. So you just have to roll what's on the sheet. And if you roll successfully, then you get to drop that concealment roll down to, uh, to an average roll also. So over time, your characters will develop these linked skills, and they'll become more relevant. And then that background, those inherent abilities or general knowledge, will then lower the difficulty of your other skills in this scenario. Mm-hmm. Now, something, something else I do find, um, in, I do find interesting is the keyword system that you ha- that you have regarding traits, wounds, friends, enemies, and so and so on. Mm-hmm. Um, what can you tell me about that and how that pl- how that plays into how how the how that into the mechanics? Yeah, the traits are going to be how you keep track of most of your characters. Um, affiliations to the outside world. So you're going to start off and you roll uh, positive or constructive, I guess we call them, uh, character traits and destructive character traits. So there are things about your character that the world would appreciate or not appreciate. And it's kind of your personality. And then you'll enter the uh, story part of your character creation where you're making these decisions that build your character's personal plot and their stats. And as you do that, you pick up more um, keywords. So these can be like, you're a culprit, you're a prisoner, you're a, um, you have a permit to sell art under the revelers, which is a, an art guild in the game. You um, are wanted for crimes, you know, you're a debtor, you owe money, um, all of these different keywords. And then these will connect to different plot points that will affect your character as you develop. So once you hit certain milestones, um, those keywords will start to have an effect on the world around you. Mm-hmm. Now, maybe you have the bounty keyword. And so as long as you're a level one character and you survive the character creation process, nobody really cares that you have a bounty or nobody. But once you hit a certain level or a certain amount of influence, 
that bounty might matter. And so then people start to pop up in your campaign that's coming after you. Um, and we're still playing out, you know, what all of these keywords are look like because there are a lot of them in the diversity of risk and opportunity in a grim dark world. Mm -hmm. um, but they're going to have a lot of long term effects on how your character plays and on some of the challenges that they're going to. And then they're also going to affect your affiliations going into the game. So right off the bat, based on the decisions that you made, once you start session one, you might be an enemy of certain groups and an ally of other groups, and those will be recorded in keywords. Mm -hmm. um, so just those kinds of interactions that your character has already had before you as a player uh, stepped into their shoes, so to speak, yep. are going to be recorded in keywords. Mm -hmm. Now, it the, now when it comes to when it comes to like maybe maybe this has been covered in one of the, in one of these stretch goals and I just hadn't I just hadn't seen it but I'm curious if in the full books you you have um a set of a a set of story seeds because when you're dealing with a grim dark world it's it's important to provide a few ideas in terms of the impetus of why people would go out and and risk life and limb Mm-hmm. Uh, so you're you're thinking like what's the motivation to, to be an adventure in this world? Yes. Well, it's more the world is kind of coming down on you. <laughs> um the whole setting, you know, it's set for those who haven't read the campaign, our setting is this is the solar system as you know it now, just a, a little less than a thousand years in the future. So most every major planetary body and moon has been developed or touched, at least by mankind, um, not fully developed, but touched. And then they reach the Kuiper Belt and the Oort cloud is collapsing and there's essentially a wall of comets that's just going to start pelting the solar system over the next couple generations. And then it's presumed that mankind's just going to be wiped out. Um, so there's this existential level of the world kind of coming down on you. And then how that plays out in the game is that there are these mega factions that have kind of defined the way that mankind has burst out into the solar system. And they've done that largely by extorting people, manipulating people, hiring people, enslaving people, all of these things. And so you're just kind of an everyday person, but that unfortunately means that these factions are coming for you and using you. Not in the sense that, you know, you're a great hero and they're trying to hunt you down, but they see you as a cog in the machine. And if you decide to not be a cog, then there are consequences. And if you decide to be a cog, there are consequences. And then on top of that, there's also the issue that all of the leadership of these organizations now see that all of this material wealth they've built up is going to evaporate in a couple of generations. And so they're making their own philosophical ideas of how are they going to pursue the future and of course you as one of their pawns is affected by that kind of reckoning that they're having mm -hmm. and so in all of these different levels the setting is just kind of crashing into you as a character and you experience that firsthand as you try and build your character and have to make these really tough decisions about how you're going to handle the issues of everyday life and then really the everyday life is what turns you into a hero um of just someone who's trying to find hope in this dark world. Mm -hmm. I can, I can certainly, I can certainly get that. Uh, now, ta now taking that in, taking that into account. Mm -hmm. uh, when it comes to obviously, obviously, um, space tra space travel is a thing, but is not, but is um, not the mo not the most forgiving affair. Right. So, you met you mentioned that it's you mentioned that space combat is ba is based on is based on um physical research, but within the actual mechan within the actual mechanical space, how does spa how does ship to ship combat work? So it varies depending on the ship, but the concept is that it's broken down kind of into zones. So you're going to have the longest distance combat is going to be um, kind of torpedoes or essentially little unmanned ships that get launched from huge like battleship cruiser type ships and then are steered or oriented or whatnot um, from thousands of kilometers away to hit other ships. 
Mm-hmm. Um, and that's going to be, you know, your most reasonable type of engagement. But you also have to factor in the fact that if you're doing across these thousands of miles, you're dealing with gravity, you're dealing with um, other objects. So it's not very common, but that's mm-hmm. one method. And the next zone, you have uh, rail gun fire, which is, it's a pretty, I mean, common sci-fi trope, but even back in you know, the 19. 19- 70s i think it was you know the u.s was looking at dropping rails from space to, to hit um the earth and it's an incredibly powerful combat method and so you have these essentially just giant steel rods being launched from ships that are in a little bit closer range mm-hmm. and then after that you have um well and again you have to consider all of the earth around it right because if one of those rods hits an actual stationary object like a settlement then you're hitting with the force of like a nuclear weapon. So there are all kinds of considerations that have to be made there, but that's more close range. Hmm. And then you get into what you would call, I guess, a boarding scenario. And this would almost never happen because the reality of space combat is that ships are fragile and that armor is impractical because launching it into space for the pure goal of adding weight to the ship um, is just really illogical and expensive. So armor isn't as much a thing, and so ships will almost never be in a scenario where they'll be hull-to-hull boarding one another. But you might have smaller vessels that are kind of going up and connecting to these larger ships. And then you have more of the traditional um, crew fighting corridors. But while this is all going down, um, the, the general consensus, at least at the moment, that space warfare will also involve huge swarms of drones. Um, and satellites. And so uh, the U.S. Space Force actually published a really interesting paper on this, saying that they believe the dominant force in space warfare will actually be these satellites. And so if you're going to be a battleship, you'll also be manning swarms of satellites that'll be intercepting um, torpedoes, railguns, whatever, uh, or acting as sensors that receive information about the thermal environment, about, you know, ships that are coming in and going, the the trajectory of railgun fire and whatnot. Mm-hmm. So all of that to say it's incredibly complicated in a scientific or, or realistic method. For you as the player, um, most of the time you won't be manning these systems unless you are like that's your role and so at that point it'll boil down to the skills the ship has and the skills that you as a character have um piloting which is one of those skills uh to interface with the skills of the ship and then the skills of the ship will reflect the drones that they have the railguns they have the torpedoes they have and the integrity of like the heat distribution systems and things like that now given the Given the die-based action economy you have, when it comes to fi- when it comes to firing weapons that are that require ammunition, do you do you treat um, reloading as it as an action, or are you a bit um, fast and loose with that concept? At the moment, we're planning to play pretty fast and loose. Uh, there's, it's difficult because a lot of weapons, you know, you don't have to reload after after every shot. You know, unlike you know, swords and sorcery where you have, you know, you fire an arrow and then you fire another arrow. Mm-hmm. Um, it's more clip of ammunition or a drum of ammunition. And then you'd have to keep track of, you know, well, they fired 50 shots, so then they have to reload. But what if they fired like 49 and they want to take a shoot action, you know? So it's just simpler to keep it more or less no actions for reloading. There are a couple exceptions. Uh, there's a huge uh, chain gun that players can actually get if you if you make the right selection of um, plot decisions to start. And something like that to reload, obviously, it'll take like an action or two, which will which will basically just be you burn a dice or two from your pool. Or there's like a shotgun where you might have to burn a dice um, to fully reload before you can make two shots. Um, but for the most part, we're planning to play play pretty fast. All right, I, I can certainly get that. Now, with that with that in with that in mind, uh, I do want to. I first off, I do want to give my congrats for the stretch goals that you that you guys have um you guys have gone have gone with. Um, in fact, in in fact, the if I'm not mistaken, the next one is going to be at going to be at 
ten and a half ten and a half k, which at the rate at the rate things are going may end may end up happening. Um. But if if I'm not, but when it comes to the when it comes to the starts when it comes to the um start scenario, um, mm -hmm. I I know that it's going to be a relatively light on light one in terms of page count. But mm -hmm. what is what can you tell me about the general angle of that um, scenario? Since again, when you have the whole of the solar system at your disposal, there's a lot of angles to take. Yeah, that's a that's a tricky one. So this was something we added by popular request. Um, previous games we haven't done the starting scenario, but it was something that a lot of people said was really important to them, particularly with something that has as in depth of a system as this one. Um, so I'm still talking with the writer to figure out what the best angle is. At the moment, our plan is to take something that most people in the solar system have to deal with, and that's going to be like harvesting, um, harvesting water, most likely, which doesn't sound super exciting, but it's going to be something that is actually going to be really cool because you as characters, pretty much anyone has to do it. So no matter what path you took through the character creation process, it's probably going to be relevant to you. It's something that is quite dangerous. Um, you're going to be out in a low atmosphere environment and all of the risks that come with it, which are going to set the stakes of the game pretty high and pretty fast. And then it's also going to, you know, cover a lot of unknown territory because you're going to be either deep in the, the rock of a foreign planet or an asteroid or something, um, or you're going to be, you know, on Earth, but you're going to be with strangers in a hostile environment. And so there's going to be lots of interesting combat opportunities. There's going to be some kind of Doctor Who-esque pseudo-paranormal stuff that we're exploring. Um because you know you're going to be dealing with oxygen deprivation, you're going to be dealing with foreign environment, darkness, all of these you know more psychological conflicts. Hmm. And so I'm hoping to flesh some of those things out that in this setting, pretty much anybody's going to have to deal with, um, and that are going to be pretty pretty applicable to no matter what kind of character people put together to start out the game. Mm -hmm. Now, I. Re now, uh, when it comes to the when it comes to the published get when it comes to the um, published guide, um, mm -hmm. is that is is that essentially you get you guys taking the the um, the core book the core book and um, put and putting it on um, DTRPG and and the like. Yeah, so it's going to be uh, the core book. Yep, it's going to be on Drive Through RPG. Uh, we're also going to be working with Ingram, um, which is Barnes and Noble's uh, wholesale book distributor. So they're going to take it uh, to put it on the Barnes and Noble website. They're going to put it um, on Amazon. Uh, our last couple books have actually made their way onto Walmart and Target as well. Um, so it's going to be available with pretty much any major retailer and uh, Drive Through RPG. And that's going to be primarily in paperback. Um, but then I'm, I'm working on looking into drive through RPGs uh, print on demand system as well. And mm -hmm. depending on how that goes, we might add it in hardcover uh, on on DRPG as well. All right, I can I can I can most definitely get behind that. Do you have you used their services much? I'm just curious as kind of a connoisseur of the gaming community, wondered. Uh, what the impression is of their stuff? Um, I primarily have used have used Drive Through RPG because, in my experience, Amazon and Barn and Barnes and Noble like like to lean towards the EPUB format, which is great. Which is great if you want if you if you use the if you use e readers a, a lot when it comes to reading PDFs. I don't. Mm. And. <laughs> I have tr I have tried to, like I I've tried to read I've tried to read certain books using the desktop version of kin of say Kindle. Mm -hmm. I didn't like how it was formatted, <laughs> and obviously okay. when it comes to a when it comes to a t now I don't know if I don't know if they tr if they try and force it on that or if, or if PDF is an option for, uh for the for it, because I've only I've I've only used the Audible not the Audible the um Kindle option twice. And both and both times I didn't like how it was formatted and you know you know well you know me well enough to know that I'm a stickler for navigation. Right. And 
the navigation that the navigation of how, when it comes to Kindle, just in general, I'm not a fan of. Okay, that's fair. So, but I but I know that there are some that there's probably going to be some who will swear by it. I'm just saying I'm not one of them. Yeah, that's fair. We did try distributing over Kindle at one point, um, but never really got much traction with it. And you know, drive through RPGs digital distribution and their audience is just so much better anyway. Um, so we actually, I think, only do the print on Amazon and Barnes and Noble now, um, just because it's a little bit easier. And then we get to do the exclusive license on drive through RPG, which is basically yeah. Um, so hopefully that PDF will be uh, just what you need. Mm -hmm. uh, as, lo as long as as long as it's a p as long as the PDF that has a table of cont that has a proper table of contents and index and bookmarks, I'm good. <laughs> yes, sir. Ever since our first talk, I've made sure to include that on each of them. And I think for this one, we're gonna have to see how much it's gonna take to do but they're going to be over 450 different um decisions or like that you can't make you're not going to have to make those to decide but to make your character but there are 450 different things you can do um mm -hmm. depending on what you roll in your in your choose your own adventure and yeah. so i'd really like to hyperlink each of those so that you can just click through that process instead of having to scroll back that would that would be advisable. I know I know that um, Dyer puts hyperlinks all throughout his stuff, which is why I don't get on him for the lack of an index in his PDFs. Mm. That's I mean yeah, yeah, it functions kind of the same, and then you don't have to scroll back up to the index, I guess. Mm -hmm. But what are you shooting for as far as a release window? Not a not a release date per se, but a ballpark estimate. Yeah, so we're committed to getting the pledges out by December of 2023. Um, and then we'll probably launch after that once everybody's arrived. So my goal, my, my fingers crossed goal, is to have it on the digital bookshelves by uh, March of 2024. Um, so that is a little ways out. So if it sounds like something that you're super interested in, you know, I hope that people jump on board because we have a track record of fulfilling early, and I'd really like to fulfill early. Um, but at the moment, unless you jump in on the Kickstarter, you're looking at March of 2024. All, all right. So, with the, so with that in, with that in mind, I do want to sincerely thank you for taking the time out of your schedule to come all the way to my temple and enjoy the madness that happens here. <laughs> It's always my pleasure, man. You were the first one to invite me to do an interview back when I did a Kickstarter, uh, like, oh, geez, five years ago now. So it's always fun to come back and revisit and see what's new. So I appreciate you putting up with me. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Anytime, man. And as always, the my door is always is always open anytime you wish to further come on, whether it be for Star Set or anything else you, you guys are working on. As I often say around here, drinking is not mandatory, but it is encouraged. <laughs> I appreciate it. It's always a good time. Right. And of course, a sincere thanks goes out to everyone who took the time out of their schedule to come onto the show and enjoy the madness. And there will be plenty more where that came from, as there always is here on the open bar of the internet. But until then, on behalf of the good brothers present and not present, my name is Mildra, I am your gaming monk, stay fucking frosty everybody! <laughs>